Hello everyone, welcome to the second episode of this course in Neuroscience, De Natura Cerebri. In this episode, we're going to meet two of our best friends, neurons and glia. They will accompany us throughout this course. In this episode, we're first going to introduce the neuron, then talk about the story of its discovery, then its structure and its classification. And at the end, we will talk about some types of glial cells. The neuron. The neuron is, first and foremost, a type of cell. It is the basic building block of the nervous system. Believe it or not, there are actually 86 billion neurons in the whole human nervous system. Wow, that is indeed a lot. In fact, it is one of the greatest number of neurons in all animals. In fact, it is one of the greatest numbers in all mammals and even in all animals. And that makes us one of the most intelligent species on planet Earth. How was the neuron discovered? To discover the neuron, we need to observe the neuron. And that requires light microscopy. Indeed, the first cell was discovered by light microscopy and the first neuron must be discovered by light microscopy as well. Is that so? Well, maybe not. Neurons, like many other animal tissues, are hard to observe directly with light microscopy because their color is too identical and we cannot discern individual cells. And so we need to stain them in order to see them. Some of the most important stains in neuroscience are the Nissel stain and Golgi stain. The Nissel stain looks like this. As you can see, the Nissel stain is somewhat pinkish and purplish. There are some little round purple blots in the pictures. What are they? If you said nucleus, then you're on the right track. They're actually the rough endoplasmic reticulum, which surround the nucleus in the cell. The rough endoplasmic reticulum provides a substrate for the ribosomes to bind to. The nissel stain interacts with the rough endoplasmic reticulum and stains it purple. Because of this, the RER are also called nissel bodies. Due to the position of the RER, mainly the neuron soma is stained, and that is the central part of the neuron. It's kind of round in shape. Another important stain is the Golgi stain. As you can see, the Golgi stain is much more finer. The Golgi stain uses silver. To be more specific, it relies on the formation of silver chromate deposits inside neurons. Intriguingly, the Golgi stain only stains around 1% of all the neurons. It might seem a disadvantage, but it is in fact the exact advantage that Golgi stain has. If we stain all the neurons black, then the whole brain would be a black mess and we cannot see even one neuron. However, when there is only 1% of the neurons stained, we can see individual neurons with extreme clarity. The Golgi stain stains the processes of the neurons. It not only stains the soma, but also the thin little filaments that extend from the soma, as you can see in this figure. There are two types of processes in neurons, namely the axon and the dendrites. We will look at them in a minute. However, with the stains, there was still a dispute about the nature of the neuron. The polemic was about whether it was contact or continuity. Camillo Golgi, who invented the Golgi stain, thought that the neurons were a continuous framework. Camillo Golgi, who invented the Golgi stain, thought that the neurons are a continuous framework. He said that the neurons are all interconnected into a big net and the somas were only nodes along the network. However, Santiago Ramon y Cajal said that neurons were individual cells. Although they seem connected, they only contact each other through physical contact, and they are not one being. This was later called the neuron doctrine, namely neurons are individual cells, just like all other cells in the human body. Who was the dispute settler? Well, it was a very, very famous guy called the electron microscope. The invention of the electron microscope in the last century settled the dispute. Well, it, this was a problem of resolution. 
the naked human eyes can see things that are around 100 micrometers apart. However, neuron soma are only about 20 micrometers in diameter. Therefore, the naked human eye is unable to see neuron soma. Optic microscopes have resolutions of around 100 nanometers, and that renders it capable of seeing the neuron soma. However, the optic microscope still cannot see the synaptic cleft, which has a width of about 20 nanometers. The synaptic cleft is what we call the separation between two adjacent neurons. This is where the neurons contact each other. Finally, with the electron microscope, which has a resolution of only 0.1 nanometers, we can see the synaptic cleft, and that told us decisively that neurons are not continuous, but rather are separated by a very, very narrow gap. Now it's question time. Who do you think would be called the father of the neuron? Was it Franz Nissel, Camilo Golgi, Santiago Ramón y Cajal, or the electron microscope? Please pause a few seconds to think about it. If you said Santiago Ramón y Cajal, then you're right. He came up with the neuron doctrine, which states that neurons are individual cells. This is what modern day neuroscience is built upon, because all the things we do are based on the fact that neurons are individual cells. Now let's take a look at the structure of the neuron. The neuron has a soma, which is also called the cell body or the perikaryon. Soma means body in Latin while perikaryon is Greek. Peri means around and karyo means nucleus. So perikaryon basically means the part surrounding the nucleus. We will call this part the soma or the cell body later because the perikaryon name is just hard to remember. Okay, so inside the soma, there is the nucleus. Just like any other cell, the neuron has a nucleus which contains the hereditary information of the neuron, the DNA. It also controls all the functions of the cell through gene expression. We also have a cytoplasmic membrane, which is just like any other membrane in living organisms, a phospholipid bilayer. And finally, what's special about neurons are the processes, namely the axon and the dendrites. With so many processes, as you can see in this figure, there are many extensions that extend from the soma. The neuron has to maintain its shape, or else it will become just a round globe. In order to maintain the shape, the neuron has a very elaborate system of cytoskeleton. It mainly consists of microtubules and microfilaments. Microtubules are made of tubulin proteins, namely alpha tubulin and beta tubulin. There are alternating subunits of tubulin proteins to form a long microtubule. On the other hand, microfilaments are actin filaments made of actin proteins. We also have many organelles that are also present in other cells. For example, we have ribosomes, which are little organelles that are in charge of the production of proteins, or to be more specific, the translation of proteins. We also have the rough endoplasmic reticulum, which are also called the Nissel bodies. Ribosomes bind to the rough endoplasmic reticulum to produce membrane proteins. We also have the Golgi apparatus, which is a place for the post-translational modifications of the proteins. And finally, we have a large number of mitochondria, which are factories to provide energy for the cell. They provide ATP for the use of other organelles and for the use of proteins. Neurons need a large number of mitochondria because there are many processes that need energy. For example, the production of a large number of proteins or the maintenance of the ion gradient inside and outside the neural membrane. Let's take a look at the processes. First, the axon. Each neuron only has one axon. It is a long process that extends from the soma all the way to some other places. It starts from the soma at a place called the axon hillock. 
Just as its name suggests, the axon hillock is a little hill-like structure. It starts from the soma and then tapers into the long, thin axon. Along the whole length of the axon, there are usually myelin sheaths. These are fatty insulations. Why is that? As you can see in this figure, the myelin sheaths are little cylindrical wrappings that wrap around the myelin sheath. They are mainly made of the phospholipid layers, so they're fatty, and they're insulators because ions cannot flow through the phospholipid layers. This provides insulation for the axon. The axon is a place for electrical signal transduction. The axon is a place for the conductance of electrical signals. Ions flow through the axon to reach the end of the axon. With the myelin sheaths, ions are not able to flow in or out of the axon freely, and this provides insulation. However, myelin sheaths do not wrap around the whole length of the axon. There are little gaps. The gaps are called nodes of Ranvier. At the nodes of Ranvier, ions can enter or leave the axon. Therefore, the ion flow in the axon is kind of jumping. It jumps from one node of Ranvier to another node of Ranvier. The technical term for this is saltatory conduction. Therefore, the fatty insulation of myelin sheath facilitates saltatory conduction and increases the speed of signal transmission along the axon. In the peripheral nervous system, the PNS, the myelin sheaths are made of Schwann cells. Each Schwann cell only wraps around one single axon and forms one single myelin sheath. On the other hand, in the central nervous system, the CNS, the myelin sheaths are made of oligodendrocytes. These cells can wrap around multiple axons to form a lot of myelin sheaths. At the end of the axon, we have the axon terminal, which is also called the terminal bouton. The axon terminal contacts the next neuron at the dendrite. So the axon of the presynaptic neuron contacts the dendrite of the postsynaptic neuron and forms a synapse. This is where signal transfers from the pre previous neuron to the next neuron. The dendrite. The dendrite is the receiver of the signal. It has many dendritic spines. Those come in a large number of variety of shapes. For example, it comes in long thin shapes, stubby shapes, or even mushroom shapes. The dendritic spine is usually where the synapse is formed with the previous axons. We will take a closer look at the synapse in a later episode, in synaptic transmission. Question time! Which structures are present in neurons but absent in almost all other cells? Are they soma, cytoplasmic membrane, rough endoplasmic reticulum, or cell processes? If you answered cell processes, then you're right. The axon and the dendrite are specific characteristics of the neurons. However, please note the word almost in the question. This means that there are exceptions. For example, glial cells also have processes, and there are some other cells, for example, cells in the immune system that may have cell processes. Nevertheless, axon and dendrites are still characteristics of the neuron. Second question, which of the following is the best analogy for the myelin sheath that surrounds axons? A. Layer of rubber around wires. B. Cell walls of plant cells. C. Soft cushions on seats. Or D. Thick walls of water pipes. The answer is the layer of rubber around electrical wires. This is because axons are transmitters of electrical signals and myelin sheaths provide insulation so that the electrical signals can flow faster. There are many distinct types of neurons. We can classify them by many criteria. For example, the number of processes. There are unipolar neurons, bipolar neurons, and multipolar neurons. We can also classify by the relationship with the central nervous system, or to say their function. This includes sensory neurons, interneurons, and motor neurons. Sensory neurons carry information from sensory organs into the central nervous system. 
Interneurons are usually inside the central nervous system and they relay information from one neuron to another. Motor neurons usually go out from the central nervous system and carry commands to the effectors. The effectors are things like muscles or glands. A similar classification is the direction of information flow. Afferent neurons carry information into the central nervous system. They are usually sensory neurons. On the other hand, efferent neurons are those that go out of the central nervous system, and they are usually motor neurons. And there are many other classifications of neurons depending on the different classification criteria. Okay, it's finally time to come upon glial cells. We talked so much about neurons, but glial cells are actually very important as well. Glia are the supporting cells of the nervous system. There are, in fact, more glia than neurons in the nervous system. So they're definitely very important. And they are the target of a lot of neurological studies nowadays. Some important types of glias are astrocytes, microglia, oligodendrocytes, Schwann cells, ependymal cells, Mueller cells, etc. Some glial cells are only present in some specific places in the nervous system. For example, the ependymal cells are only present on the walls of the ventricles. They are responsible for producing cerebral spinal fluid. Mueller cells are only present in the retina in the eye, and they upkeep the function of photoreceptors in the retina. Let's take a look at some specific glial cells. This is an astrocyte. It has many processes, but it doesn't have distinct processes like the axon or the dendrites. The astrocyte is responsible for support and nutrition of neurons, formation and maintenance of synapses, development of the nervous system, and the maintenance of the blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier is a cellular barrier formed between blood vessels and brain tissue. There are some substances or chemicals that are harmful to brain tissue but flow in the blood. This blood-brain barrier prevents those substances to enter the brain from the blood. This is a microglia. As its name suggests, it's a microglia, very small, and only has a few processes. However, it is still very important. It regulates the inflammation response in the nervous system and clears the debris, for example, the dead cells inside the nervous system. This figure shows an oligodendrocyte. The green oligodendrocyte extends its many processes to wrap myelin sheaths around axons. It wraps around many axons. On the other hand, we also have Schwann cells. Those two types of cells are both responsible for the wrapping of the myelin sheath. Final question time. Could you recall some differences between neurons and glial cells? Well, there are several differences. For example, neurons have two distinct types of processes, the axon and the dendrite, while glial cells usually do not have distinct types of processes. Secondly, neurons are all excitable. They can transmit electrical and chemical signals, while on the other hand, glial cells may not necessarily be excitable. And thirdly, glial cells support neuronal function directly. While neurons may also be essential for each other's survival, this effect is more indirect. Let's have a brief recap of this episode. We first had an introduction to the neuron, then talked about the discovery of the neuron, the structure of the neuron, and the classification of neurons. And finally, we touched upon some important types of glial cells and their functions. In the next episode, we are going to dive into the world of electrophysiology. Let's electrify the neurons together. See you in the next episode.